This video is sponsored by Remarkable. Hello and welcome to this episode of Night Sky News for June 2023 with me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst. This is the show where we chat about what you should look out for in the night sky in the next couple of weeks and we chat about what's been happening in space news in the past few weeks. This month we're chatting about Betelgeuse and the new study estimating it could go supernova in our lifetimes, plus JWST finding water on a comet and much more. There's chapter markers down here if you want to skip ahead to any specific news story, plus any scientific research papers I mentioned are all going to be linked in the video description down below, free to read. So without any further ado, let's kick things off and start by looking up. We are now in June and that can only mean one thing solstice. Now that's great news if you're a stargazer in the southern hemisphere because you've currently got the longest of nights, whereas those of us in the northern hemisphere have currently got the shortest of nights, which aren't so great for stargazing. Plus, if you're north of around about 47 degrees in latitude, so north of sort of like Seattle or Paris, then you don't reach official night time in the weeks around solstice. So those of us in the UK, we stay in astronomical twilight where the sun doesn't drop more than 18 degrees below the horizon and the sky doesn't fully get dark ever. That means at this time of year, those of us up north can't see the faintest of objects against that background glow of twilight. So we do, if we want to do some stargazing, have to focus on some of the brighter objects like planets, but also phenomena like noctilucent clouds or night shining clouds, as they're sometimes called. They're too faint to be seen during daylight. They're ice crystals incredibly high in the atmosphere. They're actually still lit by the sun during astronomical twilight. So keep an eye out at this time of the year if you're in those northerly latitudes in the northern hemisphere. I actually managed to spot some really late night after a friend's wedding when I was in Cornwall this weekend. And I quickly snapped this picture with my phone. If you manage to do the same and spot some noctilucent clouds and snap them with your phone like I did, or perhaps a better camera, then tag me in your pictures over on social media because I would love to see them. Now, speaking of solstice, we're very lucky that on the 21st of June, we do have a very bright trio to look out for. As the beautiful toenail moon, more commonly known as the crescent moon, approaches Venus and Mars. Now, this is visible wherever you are in the world in the hours just after sunset in the West. Venus will be the easiest planet to pick out because it is so incredibly bright in the sky, whereas Mars will be a little bit fainter and have that slightly reddish glow to it. Now, if you only manage clear skies after after solstice, then the moon will have moved much closer to Mars, and maybe that'll help you pick Mars out. But if you then keep an eye on Venus and Mars over the next few nights, you'll see them getting closer together from our perspective here on Earth as they move along their orbits. Until on the 1st of July, they reach their closest separation around about 3.5 degrees. Put that into context, if you hold your hand out at arm's length in front of you, then two fingers is around about three and a half degrees separation on on the sky. Now, when two objects come together like this, come close on the sky, we call this a conjunction. So it's just a fun thing to keep your eyes on over the next couple of weeks, you know, through late June and early July, just to feel that little bit more connected to everything going on beyond the surface of our planet. Now, the other bright planets that we can see just with our eyes, we don't need binoculars or telescopes, like Saturn and Jupiter, they're also visible again in our skies, this time in the morning. With Saturn rising in the east around midnight, and then Jupiter a few hours later. So for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, we'd either have to be up very late or up very early. But for those in the Southern Hemisphere where you have quite late sunrises at the minute, it's more likely that you're going to be up before dawn. And if you are, have a look out for Saturn and Jupiter in the North. And lastly, the full moon on the 3rd of July is the first of a few supermoons we're going to have in 2023. A supermoon is when the moon is just ever so slightly closer to Earth in its oval shaped orbit. So it's slightly bigger and brighter on the sky. However, the human eye cannot pick out those differences in brightness or in size of the moon, so just be aware of that with the inevitable media hype that seems to come with supermoons. And remember, if you think it does look bigger when it's rising, that's just a trick of perspective and nothing to do with the fact that it's a supermoon. All right, that's enough of looking up at the night sky. Before we chat about what's been happening in space news, though, I just want to say a big thank you to Remarkable for sponsoring this week's video. The Remarkable 2 is the next generation paper tablet. 
And when I first made the jump from using paper notebooks to taking digital notes for my science research lab notebook, I started using my existing tablet. But there was just too many distractions with all my social media apps and my emails, even my texts pinging through. There was just too much noise for me to focus on what I was doing, especially if I was reading a scientific research paper, which is in such technical language. It's very easy for my mind to wonder if there's an obvious distraction. But then I discovered The Remarkable 2, a digital device that helps you focus on the task at hand. Like I found I've been so much more productive using it because not only has it removed distractions, but it's allowed me to organize my notes so much better. Like I've always loved the freedom of handwritten notes over type ones and you know, just felt like I had to cope with the fact that it wouldn't be easy to find certain notes or ideas in them. But with The Remarkable 2, I can have folders keeping different research projects separate from each other or separate from notes I've taken in seminars. I put off the switch to digital for so long because I thought nothing could replace a paper notebook. But The Remarkable tablet feels just like paper. There's a resistance to it when you write. It doesn't have that click and clack of technology removing yet another distraction. What's more is that I can access my notes now wherever I am on any device with Remarkable's cloud storage. The Remarkable 2 really has changed the way I work for the better. It's tech that feels like it works with you and not against you. I I cannot recommend it enough if you're a student or a professional or want to use it at home and you've been inspired to make the switch into distraction-free digital note-taking. So you can discover more about The Remarkable 2 at the link in the video description down below. A big thank you again to Remarkable. And now let's come back down to Earth and chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. All right, well, we've got to start with the research paper that caught everybody's attention this month, which was this from Seiyo and collaborators, which claims that the star Betelgeuse could go supernova in the next few decades. You heard me, decades, not centuries, not millennia or millions of years, you know, the usual astronomical timescales that we deal with, but decades. And yes, before the inevitable comments roll in, Betelgeuse is over 600 light years away. So it could have already gone supernova, but the light hasn't actually had enough time to travel to us here on Earth yet. But we're talking about in Earth's frame of reference, right? The light that we are receiving now suggests that we could be seeing the light from a supernova in a few decades time. But before we get too excited, let's chat about where this claim comes from. What is the evidence that they have here? Well, it's all to do with how Betelgeuse's brightness changes, but it's nothing to do with the great dimming event where Betelgeuse's brightness abnormally dipped by a huge amount from December 2019 to February 2020. I actually covered it at the time in a Night Sky News episode, and then again in another Night Sky News episode from August 2022, when a study was published claiming that this great dimming was due to a big ejection of material from Betelgeuse's surface. But along with that very unexpected change in Betelgeuse's brightness, there's also a lot of regular changes in Betelgeuse's brightness that we're aware of thanks to decades of observations. So there's a few patterns in the changes to the brightness that aren't quite as dramatic. There's two main ones with patterns that repeat every 2,200 days and every 420 days. And then there's two that are just a little bit harder to pick out from the data that happen every 230 and 185 days. These changes in the brightness are essentially caused by pulsations in the star due to this endless fight between gravity pulling inwards and then the energy from nuclear fusion and the gas pressure pushing outwards. So if you make a model of Betelgeuse the star at its mass and its size, you can start working out, okay, well, what conditions inside the star would be responsible for making these pulsations of every, you know, 2,200 days and 420 days, et cetera, et cetera. That's what Seiyo and collaborators have done here and found that to explain these pulsations, Betelgeuse can no longer be fusing hydrogen into helium, but instead fusing carbon atoms together to make heavier elements like neon or magnesium. 
So if you think about what's going on in the interior of a star during its lifetime, now you need incredibly high temperatures and incredibly dense pressures for fusion to take place, just to, to even to bring hydrogen atoms close enough together to get them to make helium. That only happens in the very core of the star. That's the only place that it's hot enough and dense enough. So during a star's you know, normal lifetime, it will just slowly be converting all of its hydrogen in that core to helium. At some point though, all of that hydrogen will run out and you'll just be left with a pure helium core. At that point, there's no process producing energy that's gonna push outwards against gravity pulling inwards. And so then the star starts to shrink in on itself. But when that happens, the core then gets hotter and denser. So much so that you can then trigger helium fusion into carbon. Of course, then when all the heliums run out, you then got a carbon core and the star shrinks again, but then you kickstart carbon fusion into neon and magnesium and so on and so on in this sort of like shrinking and more fusion process until you get to silicon fusion into iron. At that point though, Fusing iron together to give you a heavier element gives you less energy out than you have to put in to get the iron atoms together. And that's when there's no other process to resist that crush of gravity and you get a supernova. All those outer layers of hydrogen collapse in, rebound off the core and out into a beautiful nebula. And then depending on the mass of the core of the star in the center, you either get a neutron star or a black hole left behind. Now all these different stages of fusion, so hydrogen fusion, helium fusion, carbon fusion, they all last for a different amount of time. The hydrogen fusion is the longest and for a star like Betelgeuse, it'll probably spend around about 11 to 15 million years fusing hydrogen into helium. Whereas a less massive star like the Sun will spend about 10 billion years fusing hydrogen into helium. The carbon fusion stage though is much shorter than the hydrogen fusion stage. And again, it varies slightly for the mass of the star that you have, but it's more like hundreds of years rather than millions or billions of years. Seo and collaborators actually looked at the fraction of carbon left in the core in each of their models that they used to explain the pulsations in the Betelgeuse's brightness and found it was very low, always less than 20%, suggesting a good chunk of the carbon in Betelgeuse's core could have been used up already and the star is nearing full-on collapse, aka a supernova. Seo and collaborators also took one of these models and plotted how long it would be before the collapse given the fraction of certain elements in the core. So this is a log plot, so on the x axis here, a five means 100,000 years, aka a one with five zeros after it. Zero means one year, a year one with no zeros after it. And minus five means 0 0.00001 years, a year one with five zeros before it in the decimal point. So you can see in the black line there, that's the amount of hydrogen and it drops as the amount of helium in the gray line goes up, but then helium starts to go down as more carbon in the red line there is made and that goes up and so on and so on. And as we just saw, the models that can reproduce Betelgeuse's pulsations in its brightness found that the carbon fractions were between 17% and about half a percent. Putting their best models for Betelgeuse in terms of how long it is before collapse between one and two on this log part meaning that there's somewhere between 10 and 100 years before Betelgeuse's collapse. Again, decades, not centuries, not millennia, decades in our lifetime. And this is what's got people so excited. The last supernova in our galaxy, the Milky Way, was back in the 1600s. So to have the opportunity to study a supernova that is that nearby as Beatrice is, around about 600 light years away, and the opportunity to study the remnant that's left behind, so the neutron star in the core after the supernova, and then of course the opportunity to actually see it yourself in the sky for the Orion constellation to look so completely different from then on. And then also maybe even see it in the daytime sky as well because it's that bright that you can see it despite the fact that the sun is so bright. It's just too exciting. Now, of course, these are just best fit models and that comes with a lot of uncertainty. So we do have to bear those caveats in mind and of course, it is all still speculation until Betelgeuse 
actually does go supernova. Next up, I want to chat about this work from Villanueva and collaborators, analyzing JWST data of Saturn's moon Enceladus, which I have been not so patiently waiting for since I saw that these observations were in the list of proposals that were awarded time back, you know, six months or so before JWST launched. So it's a long time coming. And the reason that there's been so much hype around these observations and finally seeing the analysis and the results is because Enceladus is one of the top candidates for where we might find life beyond Earth in the solar system. I've actually made a whole video on this before in relation to Saturn's moons. If you want to check it out, I'll pop a link in the video description below. But a quick recap of that video for you. In 2005, the Cassini mission flew by Enceladus and found a plume of water vapor being launched from Enceladus's South Pole at a rate of over 150 kilograms per second. To have such a high rate of flow of water in these plumes suggests there must be a very large source of water on Enceladus. So we actually reckon Enceladus has a rocky core surrounded by a water ocean and then a very thick icy crust. Now the Cassini spacecraft also flew directly through the plumes to see what else it could detect in the water and found that it was actually salty water and it contained things like carbon dioxide and also ammonia as well. The kind of molecules that are the ingredients that you would need there for life. So you could perhaps imagine there being extreme bacteria on Enceladus, the kind of things that we see living next to deep undersea vents on Earth. So this was always going to be a top target for JWST. You know, with its increased sensitivity just because of its sheer size, it should therefore be able to take an image of how far this plume extends, but then also take a spectrum as well, where you split the light through a prism, you get the trace of how much light each wavelength you receive, and you can look for the fingerprints of certain molecules in that trace of light to work out once again, what is this plume made of? So let's start with this incredible image of the plume. For context, Enceladus is smaller than a pixel in this image. It's only about 500 kilometers or so across. And you can see that the plume extends much further than that. Villeneuve and collaborators actually measured the extent of the plume to be up to 10,000 kilometers or 40 times Enceladus's radii away from the moon itself. And then from the size of the plume, you can also estimate the rate of the outgas is around about 300 kilograms a second. These observations also confirm the existence of a torus of water around Saturn, so a, a donut shape essentially, which is caused by the fact that Enceladus is in orbit around Saturn, right? It only takes 33 hours to complete one single orbit. And of course, in that time, all that water from the plume gets spread out into this very thick ring, creates actually a whole new ring around Saturn known as the E ring. Now, Villanueva and collaborators found from this JWST data that about 30% of the water in the plume ends up in this ring, whereas the other 70% disperses across the Saturn system, including all the other moons supplying them with water as well. What's puzzling though is the results that they found when they took that spectra of the plume, where they split the light and got that trace of how much light each wavelength you receive. Because it showed there was lots of features to indicate that water was present, it was majority made of water, but there was no evidence for things like ammonia, NH3, or or carbon dioxide CO2, like what was found by Cassini when it flew through the plumes. Suggesting either it's not there anymore, it was there in the past, but it no longer is, so perhaps the contents of this plume change, or two, that perhaps we're not looking at this from the right angle, perhaps these sort of heavier molecules like carbon dioxide, ammonia, maybe they hang around closer to the actual South Pole, we're not quite looking at the South Pole itself, or three, JWST isn't sensitive enough to pick up these features. So it's interesting to think what might be going on here. It's especially interesting that there wasn't a detection of ammonia, NH3, because that acts to lower the freezing point of water in the same way that when you like sprinkle salt on your driveway in winter or on the roads, it lowers the freezing point so that you don't get as much ice forming on the roads. Ammonia also does that. And so when that was detected by Cassini, that was sort of a, a big sort of like, oh, well, that'll lower the freezing point of water. So it makes a liquid ocean much more likely under the surface of Enceladus. But we don't 
see that here. We don't have any evidence for it. So these are really interesting first results. And these observations were very short, only a few minutes or so in exposure time to demonstrate, you know, what JWST was capable of. And so that could be why the detection is not there. You know, these observations were only just meant to be a proof of concept to prove it was possible to actually study this with JWST. But it's interesting to think that in the future, you know, JWST could become the main workhorse instrument to sort of keep an eye on Enceladus's water plumes and then perhaps inform, you know, if we're planning any future missions to the moons of Saturn, like what we'd want to actually test out from the questions that are raised by JWST data. So it's not surprising to see a proposal to study Enceladus was recently awarded time for the second year of JWST observations in cycle two. Check out my video from last week where I actually picked out my highlights from the upcoming second year of JWST observations. Uh, I'll link that in the video description down below. And finally, another JWST water-related discovery. Let's talk about this study from Kelly and collaborators that detected water on a comet in our solar system. And that might not sound that exciting at first description. We've known for a long time that comets have water on them, but this is not just any old comet. It's what's known as a main belt comet because it's found in the main asteroid belt of the solar system between Mars and Jupiter. Sometimes you'll even hear people refer to these main belt comets as active asteroids because that's kind of what really differentiates an asteroid from a comet is activity. Asteroids, right, are just lumps of rock, but comets are lumps of rock and ice that when they get close to the sun, the ice starts to melt and you get outgassing like carbon dioxide and water vapor escaping in this big halo known as a coma around the comet and in a tail that streams away from the sun. And most comets have really long orbits that take them way out to the far edges of the solar system past Neptune, before bringing them back very close to the sun after hundreds, if not thousands of years. But these main belt comets that, you know, we've really only known of you know, more than a handful of since about the 2010s, these have orbits similar to asteroids, you know, just a bit more oval shaped than planets orbits. So you still do get that variation in them coming closer to the sun and then further away again. So we do see them develop these like comet like halos as they get closer to the sun and stuff starts to melt. The problem is we've never had a telescope sensitive enough before to actually observe them because they're really pretty small and pretty faint to work out, you know, are these halos made of the same stuff that like, normal comet halos and tails are made out of, you know, and we've never sent a spacecraft to them before either to study them. But now we've got JWST. So Kelly and collaborators used JWST to observe Comet 238P with NearSpec, one of the main spectroscopic workhorses on board JWST, to get that, you know, trace of how much light each wavelength you get from the comet. And in it, they found those telltale signatures that water leaves on light. And so confirming that the halo of this main belt comet is made of mostly water vapor, just like with other comets. Now, the reason why that's such a big result, that it's very similar to other comets that we see, is because it's thought that comets, like impacts with comets on Earth, is what brought water to Earth. And we know it's water that kick-started life. And if we think about, you know, how that actually happened, how many impacts you would have had to have had to give the early Earth enough water, and the only comets we know of are these long period comets that take hundreds if not thousands of years to make it back into the inner solar system from the outside, then you're limited to the rate at which water can actually build up on Earth through impacts because of the fact that they just end up going so far out of the solar system. But if you've now got main belt comets that also have water in these halos that are very similar to normal comets, then you've got a lot of comets a lot closer to home. You can have more frequent impacts and you can build up the water that much faster. But that's not the whole story. Because Kelly and collaborators also found that the spectrum of Comet 238P doesn't have any evidence for carbon dioxide, one of the most abundant molecules found in comet halos after water. And if you compare the spectra for 238p with the one for a very typical comet, so 103p, taken by the Deep Impact mission, which was a spacecraft, nothing to do with the Elijah Wood and Tealioni film, sadly. Comets are still headed for Earth. 
You can see that the two spectra are very similar at shorter wavelengths, both containing those water features, but 238p spectra is missing that bump left by the presence of carbon dioxide, CO2. So that's weird that this main belt comet 238p is so different in that regard to the long period comets, your typical comets that we're used to. That has sort of some implications of, okay, well, if it's main belt comets that impacted with Earth, did they not bring, you know, anything else apart from water, you know, any other molecules that could have, you know, been sort of the kickstart sort of ingredients for life as well that other comets could have brought? How does that sort of impact, you know, that whole hypothesis? <laughs> impact that whole hypothesis, get it? So the team have floated two ideas to explain why this might be. First of all, that the main belt comet did have carbon dioxide at one point, but it's just lost it all already. And that's because the main belt asteroid portion of the solar system, much warmer than the outer reaches of the solar system, just by virtue of being closer to the sun. And carbon dioxide does evaporate a lot more easily off the surface of comets. So it's just lost it all already, perhaps. The second idea is, is that it just formed in a very warm part of the solar system in the first place where there was no carbon dioxide to start with. But with the data we have at the minute, we have no way to tell which scenario is the most likely. So the next steps are going to be to observe more main belt comets with JWST now that we know that this is possible. So it should come as no surprise to find out that there is a proposal to do just that in the list for next year's observations with JWST with the aim of finding out if other main belt comets are also carbon dioxide deficient or if this is something that's just unique to comet 238p. All right, that's it for this month's night sky news. As always, if you snap any pictures of the night sky or if you see any space news stories that you want me to explain in a future night sky news video, then tag me in those posts on social media because I'd always love to see them. But until next time, everybody, happy stargazing. We are now in June and that can only mean one thing. It's solstice. Solstice? <laughs> Sorry, I've got a parcel for my mum's birthday being delivered at home. <laughs> I got to text my dad being like, don't let mum answer the door. Thanks again to Remarkable. <laughs> Still having trouble with that month thing. Why? Month. 2200, 420, 230, 185. Numbers in my brain. Numbers in my brain. 230 and 185 days. Is that right? Yeah, nailed it first time. Oh, I did remember the numbers. I'm so excited. Fusing helium into crap, carbon. <laughs> uh, I was like, carbon or oxygen, carbon or oxygen. <laughs> Never had a spacecraft that we've actually sent to a main belt asteroid. Yeah, asteroid, main belt comet. I knew that was going to happen at some point. You just say main belt, you say asteroid. <laughs> Rarer than the glimmer of a comet in the sky. Rarer than the glint of a main belt comet in the sky, that's for sure. Change those lyrics, Tay Tay. <laughs>